For those who are relatively new to the field, you've always known ABA to be associated with functional analysis methodology. And that obviously wasn't always the case. And when I started in the field, that term really wasn't even used, certainly not the way we use it now. And so I want to give just a bit of background and then also talk a little bit about just maybe some more day-to-day -day type questions that came up when we did a uh, functional analysis with one of the little guys that we work with on elopement. We had a lot of BCs and a few CAs who were there asking a variety of questions about what we're doing, why we're doing it, that type of thing. There's a book actually out called Pasteur's Quadrant and it's important for our field. It ties into basic research, applied research, and then something again called translational research. And you've got some folks up here, so if you have, say, a quest for fundamental understanding and then consideration of use, how practical is what you're working on? Well, you have some people up here, somebody by the name of Niles Bohr, who is known as a pure basic researcher. If you are trying to draw any parallels, it might be people who are studying things like you know, viruses or the immune system if there weren't basic researchers studying very basic processes, we would have never had those vaccines as quickly as we did. If they went home and somebody said, mom or dad, what does this all mean? They might say, I'm just studying viruses, right? Just because I like doing that. But there are gonna be other people out there and take this area, the peer applied researcher, Thomas Edison as an example, really just wanted to make a better light bulb, all right? He wanted to help people, wasn't all that concerned about the basic properties behind it, but again, just wanted to apply it to something. Then you have a third quadrant, and Pasteur, who we know for pasteurizing milk, is up here, and it's called use-inspired research, also known as translational research. And what that type of research does is it blends basic questions, why do these things work the way they do, with also applied relevance. How can we make the world better? And the reason I mention this is that obviously in our field, we've got the something called the experimental analysis of behavior. There is a schism that was developing in the field of behavior analysis back then. And part of it had to do, you know, one of the most commonly cited articles in our field is one by Bear Wolf and Risley, 1968, where they tried to define what the field of applied behavior analysis was. The, the concern there was that they, they sort of equated the term analysis with a strong experimental design or convincing experimental design. And as other people in the field mention, I, I list some of the names here, uh, some pretty prominent people. I'm sure you've heard, we heard ACT already today, Steve Hayes. Uh, developed ACT among other people. Jack Michael, uh, Pearson Epling wrote a pretty popular textbook on the field. All those folks had some concerns with the use of the term analysis and their point was is that for most of us, if we're trying to figure out why a child, let's say, is doing what they're doing, it's not so much the design that we're interested in, we're trying to figure out what environmental factors may be antecedents to that behavior, what are consequences to that behavior. Again, dating myself here, but my first ABBA conference was, I think, 1982. And it was in Milwaukee, about 50 miles from my hometown, so it was very easy for me to get down there. But I remember uh, people like Don Baer presenting. And one of the things he mentioned, uh, he gives a story about why, why we don't need to know about basic principles. And the story he told was that he and his wife were driving through the Midwest, the Great Plains, and their daughter uh, came down with a fever. Uh, they pulled into a local hospital. You know, there were no urgent cares at that, at that time. Pulled into a local hospital. The ER doctor, you know, gave some, you know, Tylenol, ibuprofen, something like that, maybe an antibiotic, and basically said, I have no idea what's wrong with your daughter. Uh, this should either help, or if it doesn't, you know, the next hospital is 150 miles down the road. Pull in, uh, they'll do more tests you know, and good luck, right? And Bear mentioned that they, they hopped in the car, fever broke, they kept driving, and his point was that physician had no understanding of the basic principles that were going on here, uh, what might have produced that fever. They treated it, or he or she treated it, 
the child was better. And his point then was for behavior analysts, we've got something really powerful called positive reinforcement. And as long as you can identify really strong positive reinforcers, you probably don't need to know what the function of behavior is, is really it was his point. People identify that though as a real divorce now, or schism, from the experimental <laughs> analysis of behavior. And you know, I'll give you one other quick story. My supervisor, when I moved out here and worked at Seashore House and at CHOP, uh, was a guy by the name of Bud Mace. And he studied under Brian Iwata. And Bud reports that when, or reported to all of us, when he first started at Johns Hopkins, it was pre-functional analysis days. And he said he was working with a client, a, a adolescent, male, strong, and he said his primary target behavior was when they'd get out of a van, this guy would start screaming, like really loud to the point where people would start running away, that type of thing. And Bud said the one day they'd been out to get ice cream and they jumped out of the van and he said this guy was about ready to scream and he took a spoonful of ice cream because he was holding it for him and he stuck it in his mouth, right? And he said the guy starts like chewing on it. It's hard to scream when you got a mouthful of ice cream, all right? And he said, so he was able to walk him into the hospital like every two or three steps, he'd stick a spoonful of ice cream in his mouth. It was like one of the most discouraging days of his life. He said, if, if this is the state of our science, you know, that we're, we're just gonna jam ice cream in somebody's mouth so they don't scream, he's like, I gotta pick a different field, right? And he said, within a few weeks of that event, Brian Iwata pulled everybody together and said, I got this thing called functional analysis that we're gonna do on self-injury. What does everybody think, all right? And the, the rest, I guess you would say, is history. Here's our friend Brian Iwata. That led us to a, a complete shift in our field. They were able to identify the function or the purpose of the behavior in these individuals. They developed individualized treatments. And again, this, goes, this is very different from the approach, again, of Bayer. And, you know, again, one of the disparaging terms that we used to be referred to was M&M &M and shock therapists, right? And that, the idea was we'd either give a bunch of M&Ms for doing the right thing, or if that didn't work, then we'd shock the hell out of you, right? And that should, that should stop the behavior as well. Well, we've moved way beyond that. And uh, so rather than just using default treatments, which often use these strong reinforcers or aversive consequences, you develop individualized treatments uh, for these folks. Mm -hmm.